an 18-year-old female college student runs the Boston Marathon. It's her first marathon, and so she's careful to keep well hydrated before enjoying the race. At the finish line, she feels severely nauseated, dyspneic, and has generalized headache. BP is 102 over 64, heart rate 95, otherwise normal exam, and her serum sodium concentration is 112. So the question is, which of the following would be the best initial treatment for this patient? Is it a liter of normal saline, fluid restriction, salt tablets orally, 100 mLs of IV, 3% saline, or a liter of a sports drink? Okay, good, wow. A lot of you knew the answer to that. How many of you are runners, by the way? Any runners in the audience? Any marathon runners? Usually there's at least one or two. This is an example of a now well-recognized uh, condition called Exercise Associated with Hyponatremia, uh, and actually one of the classic papers on this was actually described about runners from the Boston Marathon. And what they discovered was that when they looked at the change in weight from before and after the race, the patients that developed hyponatremia, far from being patients who were dehydrated and lost weight, were actually the patients who had gained the most weight. And so the conclusion from the, so the first conclusion is that these were patients who drank too much water. So a lot of them were novice runners who weren't really sure how much to drink and followed recommendations to drink as much fluid as possible. Uh, the second thing is that when you look at the urine osmolality in these patients, it does not look like a patient with psychogenic polydipsia. It's not low. Actually, it's elevated a little. And so that indicates that there's a second problem, which is that these patients' ADH levels are inappropriately elevated. Put another way, these patients have a mild transient SIADH, presumably due to the exertion or the pain, the fatigue, somehow stimulating ADH. So this tells us two things. Firstly, that um, it's not just uh, a problem of hypovolemia, so you can't treat these patients with isotonic saline or sports drinks. Um, and the second is that if you want to correct the serum sodium, because the urine is concentrated, you need something more concentrated than normal saline for the reason that I explained to you a little earlier. So you would need something like hypertonic saline. Uh, and indeed, this turns out to be quite important because these are patients who have very acute hyponatremia. Over the course of the three or four hours of this race, their sodium is acutely dropped, and so the patients are at risk of cerebral edema, and so you can't wait and just restrict fluids or give them oral salt tablets. You have to bring up the sodium rapidly. Um, and uh, the current recommendation is to bring up the sodium uh, with 100 mLs of hypertonic saline, which is now available in most tents after a, um, a marathon. And this is supposed to bring up serum sodium by about 68 milliequivalents per liter over the course of about an hour or two. So D is, in fact, the correct answer here. <coughs> a 30-year-old with anorexia is found to be hypokalemic. K is 3.2, bicarb of 32, urine volume is 1 liter, it has 80 milliequivalents per liter of potassium, chloride is 44, calcium is 300. And the question is, which is the most likely cause of this patient's laboratory findings? Is it loop diuretic abuse, laxative abuse, Gittleman syndrome, thiazide diuretic? Heuretic abuse or surreptitious vomiting? Okay, good. So half of you picked the correct answer, which is that this is probably loop diuretic abuse. And I'll go through why that is, because this is a challenge case. So in the differential diagnosis of hypokalemia, we have to consider shift of potassium into cells, GI loss of potassium, or urinary K wasting. Uh, when you get a question like this on the boards, they'll probably give you the 24-hour urine potassium. So in the setting of hypokalemia, 24-hour urine potassium should be reduced. If it's not, 
meaning more than 25 milliequivalents per day, it suggests they're losing potassium in the urine. Um, there's a very wide differential diagnosis. This is a very busy slide. Uh, suffice it to say that on this slide are the patients that have hypertension and hypokalemia, and those are all forms of hypo, uh, sorry, hyperaldosteronism, uh, and that's not the case in this patient. Uh, on this side are patients that have uvolemia or even hypovolemia and have hypokalemia, and the common causes of this are vomiting, Barters and Kittleman's and diuretic abuse. Or let me rephrase that. The common causes that cannot be elicited simply by taking a history are Barters and Kittleman's diuretics and vomiting, which can be surreptitious. In this case, the clue here is that the urine chloride was high. So in patients with vomiting, and hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis, the urine chloride is low. Here, the urine chloride is a surrogate measure of volume status, where a patient who's vomiting and volume depleted will lower their urine chloride as much as they can. So low urine chloride suggests vomiting. If the urine chloride is high, that suggests that the patient has a disorder associated with sodium chloride wasting, which means either that they are receiving a drug that inhibits sodium chloride reabsorption, such as a lupathiazide diuretic, or they have a genetic mutation that inhibits the sodium chloride transport. Now, the other clue here, um, so this is a very subtle point, is the patient's urine calcium was high. So barters and loop diuretics act in the thick ascending limb, and both of those are associated with hypercalciuria, whereas Gittleman's and thiazide diuretic use do the opposite. They actually lower your urine calcium. And we know this because that's why we use thiazides to treat, for example, patients with idiopathic hypercalciuria who are forming kidney stones. So this patient had a high urine calcium, so the most likely cause is either abusing loop diuretics or barters. Now, barters is a disorder of infancy, very unusual to present in adult life. So uh, most likely this patient was uh, surreptitiously abusing loop diuretics diuretics, which, as you know, can be quite common. Uh, case 12 is a 23-year-old male with a newly diagnosed hypertension. He is asymptomatic, has no family history, is just very mildly obese, and this is his blood pressure, 145 over 97, and his potassium is 3, bicarb is 29, and he has a plasma renin activity of 0.7 and a plasma aldo of 3.9, both of which are below the normal range, 25 urine potassium is 65. And so the question is, what would be the best next diagnostic test? Is it serum metanephrines, Doppler of the renal arteries, 24 urine aldo, 24 urine 18 hydroxycortisol and 18 oxocortisol, or 24 urine cortisol levels? And um, yeah, there's a little confusion here. I suspect a lot of people chose D because it's the one that they didn't really know too well and seemed like the last option. Actually, E is probably the correct diagnosis here, and I'll tell you why. So if we follow the algorithm for a patient with hypertension, which is probably secondary hypertension because it presented in the 23-year-old, hypertension and hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis, as I mentioned, these are patients that have hyperaldosteronism, by which I mean that either their aldo levels are high or they're having a condition that mimics high aldo levels. The classic cause of this condition is Kahn syndrome or primary hyperaldosteronism, which is a condition that causes unrestrained release of aldosterone and which secondarily feed back to the renin to lower renin. So in primary hyperaldo, renin levels are low and aldo levels are high.
uh, glucocorticoid remediable aldosteronism, which is an uncommon genetic disorder that causes hyperaldosteronism, has a biochemical profile that's identical. These are patients who make too much aldo because the aldo synthase gene is under the control of the uh, glucocorticoid stimulated promoter. Um, so GRA actually gives you abnormal metabolites, 18 hydroxycortisol and 18 oxocortisol. So these metabolites are checked in the urine when you suspect GRA. But that's not what this patient has because you would expect if this were the case, aldo levels would be high, and this patient's aldo levels weren't high at all. Um, these are causes of secondary hyperaldosteronism, patients who first stimulate renin, which is high, and that stimulates aldo. So the classic example is renal artery stenosis, where there's impaired perfusion to the kidney, and the kidney responds by releasing excessive amounts of renin. Renanoma is a rare tumor of the um, juxtaglomerular apparatus that also releases too much renin. But again, that's not what this patient has. This patient falls into this group, patients who behave as if their aldo levels are high, but in fact have low aldos, low renin. Why could you have that? Uh, commonest cause, Cushing's. Remember, glucocorticoids are able to stimulate the mineralocorticoid receptor if present in excess. So Cushing's can do it. Littles, an inherited disorder of excessive amounts of uh, excessive activity of the epithelial sodium channel, ENAC. Uh, licorice and the syndrome of apparent mineralocorticoid excess are conditions where there's inhibition of that enzyme, beta HSD, that degrades cortisol. So any of these are possible in this patient, but statistically speaking, uh, the most common is Cushing's, and so you'd be obliged in this patient to check cortisol levels, and so E is in fact the correct diagnosis here. Next case is a 19-year-old male student visiting from Taiwan, presents to the ER with acute onset of flaccid muscle weakness. He denies diarrhea or vomiting on no meds, and his potassium is 1.7, bicarb is 25, urine potassium is less than 5. Uh, which of the following would be appropriate in the management of this patient? Should you repeat with 160 milliequivalents of KCL? Should you give this patient loperamide, endomethacin, check TSH level, or do none of the above? Okay, okay good. So most of you chose the correct answer, which is D. So um, this patient's urine potassium was very low, so this is not urinary K wasting. Uh, if this were GI loss, the patient would have had to be, have very severe diarrhea or vomiting to get your serum K down to um, 1.7, and doing so without any acidosis or alkalosis would be quite unusual. So this is obviously a case of cellular shift. Hypokalemic periodic paralysis comes in two uh, flavors, an inherited form, which is quite rare, and an acquired form, which is quite common, uh, particularly in young Asians associated with thyrotoxicosis. And the appropriate response to this is to check thyroid function and to make sure that you don't replete these patients with too much potassium. Since these patients' whole body potassium stores are actually normal, loading them up with too much potassium uh, in response to this very low serum potassium is potentially dangerous because they can rebound and develop hyperkalemia. Uh, next case is a 67-year-old male with hypertension for 30 years who's been having worsening blood pressure control just over the past year. And he had an MI two years ago. He's on a bunch of cardiac meds. Blood pressure is 163 over 95. Uh, K is 3.4, bicarb 27. Um, your analysis has shown serum creatinine is a little elevated at 1.6. And the question is, which test would you want to use to uh, identify the cause of this patient's hypertension? Is it MRA of, of the renal arteries, CT scan of the adrenal glands, serum metanephrines, 
urine tetrahydrocortisol to tetrahydrocortisone ratio, or none of the above. Okay, good. So most of you chose A, which is an MRI of the renal arteries. So the fact that this patient has had hypertension for 30 years, but now at age 67 is worsening, suggests that the patient might have had essential hypertension, but now has another superimposed secondary cause. Patient's obviously a vasculopath, so he's certainly at risk of developing renal artery stenosis. I'm trying to think if I gave you the renins and now those. No, I didn't. So that would certainly be my, my first guess. And so in that setting, the appropriate workup would be some sort of uh, imaging test for the renal arteries, either a MRA or Doppler. Um, CT scan of the adrenal glands is not really an appropriate first diagnostic test for anything. If you suspect uh, Kant syndrome, which is also in the differential, although less likely at this age, uh, the appropriate um, workup is first to check renins and aldose. Doing a CT scan doesn't help because it simply picks up uh, so-called adrenal incidentalomas that you then have to work up again to see whether they're even functioning or not. Uh, serum metanephrines uh, to work up for um, um, uh, simple adre adrenaline, adrenaline secreting tumor, uh, pretty unlikely here and urine tetrahydrocortisol to tetrahydrocortisone ratio that's used to look for patients with the syndrome apparent mineralocorticoid excess, which A, is extremely rare, and B, shouldn't present initially at age 67. And so A is the best answer here. Uh, and this is, again, to remind you uh, of the causes of hyperaldosteronism, both common and rare, and to show you how you would work it up so renal artery stenosis, you'd work up with either a, a captopril renal scan or a Doppler ultrasound or an MRA. Primary hyperaldosteronism, we usually screen for by looking at the aldo concentrations of renin uh, activity ratio. And if it's high, we would do a confirmatory test uh, where we salt load them and either measure serum aldo or 24 urine aldo. GRA is usually detected by looking for abnormal metabolites in the urine, 18-oxo and hydroxycortisol. Cushing's, we would look for at cortisol levels. Liddles, nowadays, is usually diagnosed by mutational analysis, and the syndrome of apparent mineralocorticoid excess is detected by, again, an abnormal ratio of the tetrahydrocortisol to tetrahydrocortisone metabolites in the urine.